I thank you all for coming this evening for a very special evening of music and conversation. Uh, my name is Anish Anish. It's a strange name. I'm the director, interim director of the Institute of World Affairs, the institute that since 1960 has been narrowing the gap between Wisconsin and the world. And tonight is no exception. Um, despite all the conflicts in the world, bloodshed, mayhem, there is also emerging a counterforce of global solidarity, that we are in it together, that there is no crisis that is really local. So the Africa's Ebola, Ebola crisis is our crisis. Not in the sense that it's threatening us in any real sense, because it's not. But it's our crisis because we stand in solidarity with those in crisis. So today, uh, all the proceeds from the ticket sales are going to go to the group called Doctors Without Borders. I'm sure you've heard all of it. And before we uh, begin the program, I'd like to uh, thank some people, our sponsors. Um, first, I want to thank Joel Berkowitz, um, who is the director of the Center of Jewish, Jewish Studies here and the professor of uh, foreign languages and literature at UWM. And Joel has been very instrumental to our production here this evening. I also want to thank the Bay Foundation for their generous support and Peck School of the Arts for allowing us to host this evening uh, in this lovely room. I also, I cannot forget these names. Um, I want to thank the Jewish Community Relations Council, UWM Master, Sustainable, Master of Sustainable Peace Building Program, UWM College of Nursing, Center for Global Health Inquiry, uh, Equity, UWM School of Public Health, Medical College of Wisconsin, Global Health Program. So all these, we really are uh, thankful to these sponsors. Uh, this is going to be a tremendous evening, and before we begin, I would like to uh, invite Patrice Petro, who is the Vice Provost uh, for International Education and Professor of English, Home Studies, and Global Studies, to just say a few words as well. All right. Good evening, everybody. It's so wonderful to see so many people here on what's a cold night, although we've been laughing at of course, us the hardy Wisconsin folks, whatever it's 25 <coughs> degrees, you think, my God, it's balmy outside. Um, now, you know, the experience of last year's polar vortex is still with us, I, I think. Um, in any event, I want to be brief so that I, I can't stand so many introductions. I know you came here not to listen to me, um, but it, I would be remiss if I didn't thank the Institute of World Affairs and its staff. We're really, really pleased to have Professor Anish as the interim director of the Institute of World Affairs, and we're really, um, he's carrying on the really great tradition of work that's been going on in the Institute for decades now. I also want to thank the Institute staff, um, Adina Wolf, Nicole Pallas, Rachel Schrag, who's also assisted with this event, but most of all I want to thank Doug Savage, who's going to be your interlocutor, who's going to be kicking off the evening tonight. Doug has worked tireless, uh, this, tirelessly on this event, he spent the day um, with the group, and I think we're in for a real treat. So, without further ado, I turn things over to Doug Savage. Right? Sierra Leone, the month of Liberia, Sierra Leone, and then here. And I'm really glad 
to be part of this forum. Thank you. My name is Dennis Bakap Sano. I play the Bumbumbu this time for the band. And um, here tonight to talk about what's happening in our country. My name is Ruben M. Kuruma, lead singer and founder of the Sierra Leone's Refugee Oysters Band. Talk about the situation in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And we, we have been chasing our all stars from pillar to post since very early this morning, so I, I especially appreciate you taking time to, uh, to do this. So maybe we could just start out with uh, a little bit of background about, uh, you know, we talked a little earlier about this. What was the situation before the crisis? I mean, sort of take us to the period post Civil War, pre Ebola. Well, I would say um, after the war, every Sierra Union has been fully engaged in trying to clear the messes, to repair those dilapidated places, you know. And um, um, the new government was trying because formerly we had just like two-way roads, but. They are trying to broaden the roads. A lot of development going on, you know, and we have also, like, the Americans help in us to, you know, they are building schools and learning institutions. The bridges are there, you know, and the uh, investors we are coming in the country and the uh, jobs we are created for youth, you know, it's like something was going on, but this Ebola has totally disconnected the people. This is what we, the people are experiencing in Sierra Leone. You know, it's, you cannot come together to do anything. Schools are closed, you know. And because of corruption, some people are accused falsely, you know. And because we don't have, like, you know, a lot of prior health facilities. That's the problem. We don't have the manpower. We are not ready for this Ebola of a thing. You know. So, you know, it happened just like a surprise. And that's why, you know, I have a song which I say is just like a salt added in a fresh food. You know, two double pains, you know. It's bad for us. We, we are very much fortunate because uh, before the outbreak, we are here in the United States. You know, we are safe and sound here, but we always worried about our people. And we talk to them every day, and they're telling us about the situation. People are dying every day. You know, sometimes the government was trying sending uh, police and military officers to go house to house you know, and uh, try to identify those who are, who are sick. And can you imagine this government found nearly 70 to 80 dead bodies? Because when you are dead, people are afraid to bury you. They will, they, they will just abandon the house and go to another place. So it's a situation that is not very good. So that is what people are experiencing. However, there has been a massive support, a massive, you know, we have uh, U.S. military, we have the bridges, we have many people who are trying really to fight this disease. And uh, hopefully we are hearing good, good signs, you know, because, um, well, they are trying to contain it. Although people are dying, but not, to, not as the way they used to, to, to die, you know. Now we have a little bit of facilities and uh, we have, you know, people well trained, you know, to treat those people who are sick. So that's the situation. And what about over the border in Liberia? What, tell us a little bit about uh, just the, the conditions before the outbreak. Yeah, well, um, so in Liberia, how many times, 1847, we have the American coming from the United States. And 
And ever since after the Civil War, the country has had time to rebuild itself. Infrastructures have been down. I was there when the war started, and I literally walked from Liberia to Sierra Leone. It took me a week to get over there. And I met the same situation. I spilled over up to Sierra Leone, and I eventually ran to Guinea, then to Ghana, back to Sierra Leone, fighting for the farm myself here over a space of about 10 years. Uh, so, uh, because of the longevity of the war, most of the infrastructure has been down. Economically, hospitals have been so bad. Uh, people cannot afford the government, have not been able to economically afford to keep the hospitals at the level they were. And so things have really been really hard for people. And then came the Ebola. With the Ebola, things have gotten very worse. I heard that uh, the government laid off a lot of workers because of the Ebola. Companies also laid off workers because the power, the purchasing power has gone very low. And a lot of people don't really understand what Ebola is. They are thinking that if you get infected and go to where the camp is, it is a death sentence for you. And so they have a kind of attitude towards the people who have come to help and they don't report it because of that. Then among the families, uh, they have experienced a whole lot in that uh, because uh, people are going through, because of what people are going through, so most of the families, as you look and look, one, Liberia was a place where, just like anywhere, where people die, burial, and all of these things. Right now, it is not happening. When you die, or when you are taking anyone for burial, you have to produce a death certificate uh, there. That there's no post-mortem. Because once the, anybody, for whatever reason, whether it's Ebola or malaria or anything, if they take you to the hospital, uh, that is it. And if you get a dead one, the assumption or the presumption is that it is Ebola. So they all tread away from those people. Uh, as I talk to you, uh, there's no schools. Schools have been down. Uh, market, out of the interior roads have been closed. Mm -hmm. And some of my friends for over 10, several years I've never heard from call me all the time, and I do understand. Mm -hmm. So the impact of Ebola is really, really serious. <coughs> uh, I'm hearing some good news there, but nevertheless. We on the side, I am head of the Liberian community here in Milwaukee. My colleague is the secretary. And so we have been mobilizing our community, coming together to help them so that we can be able to cope with the situation. We have a sister organization in Madison, one of the Liberian Association with Wisconsin. Over the past three months, there have been inundation of reports. I will see on the line letters, oh, this person was his uncle, or oh, this person has passed. There have been a lot of funerals back in my for families, day and night. My brother came, he would be called me one day, and was very chill. He said, um, I, will, I want to work for the Ebola team. I said, why? He said, yeah, because though you are helping us, and this, but the demand here is too heavy. And the Ebola team is the only source of income generally here because there's no way people are getting paid. So I said, oh, how can you do that? You are not trained. He said, well, they are going to train us. But we will work with the burial team. They have people who dispose of the bodies and the whole lot. And, you know, that, those are the situations that are happening. But we are very grateful to the international community for the support they're providing to Liberia, the United States, and the world over for their support. Uh, what we've seen there, they have brought some amount of improvement. Uh, we heard that the cases are kind of minimized, and they are going down, and that's good news for us here, a relief back home. And not even in the midst of all that, uh, we will continue to work with people. And that is why our community is working with all our partners here in Milwaukee, including uh, partners that have put this particular program together to make it a success. And we ourselves intend to hold a program on the 13th of December fundraising with regards to this Ebola crisis. Thank you very much. Said, I think one of the biggest problems in Liberia was awareness. And this disease.
disease started, people were not communicating the correct information on how to take prevention. So because of lack of awareness, the disease spread. And I will just give you a little statistic of today, up to today from CDC. Um, in Guinea, there were 2,164 cases. And laboratory confirmed was 1,929. And death was 1,327. Liberia was 7,635 total, uh, total cases. And uh, laboratory confirmed was 2,000. 801 person and total death for 3,145. In Sierra Leone, it has 7,312 confirmed cases and it has 5,978 laboratory confirmed and it has 1,583 deaths. So total death as of now from CDC is 6,055 people die from this disease just because of awareness. We could prevent this disease but because people are not informed People decided to do the wrong thing and the disease spread. Thank you. So th that brings up a good point. Dennis, maybe we could talk a little bit about the, the project that uh, the All Stars have done to raise awareness with the, uh, the, the broadcaster back home. Well, yeah, there is a local TV called We Own TV. They have a TV and they, they decided to do like dramas and then, you know, play those dramas on the TV to sensitize people about how to prevent yourself from the disease. And so, in our pastor, we were able to raise a thousand dollars. We sent it to these guys, and they've been doing a very good job. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that I, I think we tend to have a very short attention span sometimes in this country, and so eventually, we hope very soon, Ebola will drop from the headlines. But as we heard, the conflicts in both countries that preceded the outbreak contributed to the severity of the outbreak because of fragile healthcare systems and infrastructure. In the same way, the crisis we're currently facing has impacts on the society going forward. So uh, we think about uh, things like agriculture, which is done communally, right? So talk a little bit about that. Oh yeah, you know, uh, typically in Africa, when we, we, we farm, we, we do that by inviting the other people to help us. So if I have my own farm and I want to brush, I will invite the other people to come and help me, you know. So all that is not happening right now. You cannot tell the other person to come and help you to steal your farm, you know. So because of that disconnection, I don't think uh, farmers are doing their work effectively right now. So uh, what I would suggest is once, once the headlines are not screaming of Ebola, there is still plenty of work for all of us to do if, uh, if we would <coughs> like to lend a hand. So at this point, I'm sure you've got questions. I'd like to, to open it up to uh, anyone who would like to ask any of our panel anything. Yes. Um, just recently, I've heard that um, people who have survived Ebola are being shunned by their communities to the extent where they're almost <coughs> being put in refugee camps because nobody wants to bring them back into the communities, which is very much against the, you know, the, the, the African communal societies that, um, that they came from. Um, how, do you, how do you suggest that um, that they can overcome this stigma. Because Before you answer, can everyone hear the questions? Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, I think it's, a, it's the same situation where I talk about uh, awareness, where the government has to step in and try to educate these people and tell them, say, well, this is the situation and this is the reality. I think that's one of the biggest things, awareness. Well, 
Well, to all in Sierra Leone, uh, I am not there right now. So, but while I'm hearing from my wife and my children, I think the government is really working very hard to educate people about the Ebola and how to protect it. And the government is cooperating with the American embassy, and they are really working very hard to, I mean, help combat the, the disease, you know. And what I think that is going wrong is corruption, you know. Sometimes people use this Ebola of a thing to revenge when when someone has a grievance and so you do something wrong to him, he can lie that you have Ebola. And you will be taken innocently and put uh, among the Ebola patients and you have the disease by that, you know. Uh, in many cases they explain to me that people do that. You know. So that's one of the fears. Yeah. Okay, just to add or uh, just to take away from what he just said, because a lot of times people hear about corruption in Africa. Corruption is due to high poverty. You know, you get 1% of the population which is successful, and you get no middle class, and you get the rest of the people are poor. So there will be a lot of exploitation and a lot of corruption. It's not intentional, but that's the only way they can survive. I just wanted to clarify that point. Yeah, and to also add to what he says, uh, based on the UNDP statistics 2007, uh, about 83% of the people in Liberia are living just under a dollar and 25 cents. 83, just be, that's before the you know, crisis. And corruption really has been an issue in Africa. Currently in Liberia, um, a lot of government workers, ministers, they have fled the country. Why? Because as the Minister of Finance, or Treasury, the particular deputy minister was infected. Apart from the man who died in Nigeria, there was another man. And so most of the workers had to stay home, and some from other ministries. In fact, the chief medical officer died in the his assistant. And there are prominent people who are in the front line of this particular crisis. So uh, it's a problem. So a lot of them are leaving the country, and I understand that many of the president have sacked them because of that. And it's a very serious issue with respect to confidence in the community, I mean, in the government, right? So I think with the coming of the international community, with the help we're giving, uh, it will be able to put that puts confidence in the populace. Yeah. You know, the, thing, the typical idea in Africa is that the people who, the expatriates, they are more trusted than the people who are there because of the big fantasy. So uh, I'm sure things should be working better now. Yes. Good question. Yes. Right, well, first of all, I need to say thank you all very much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's really great. Um, and I have a very naive question. Does anybody know like, where Ebola came from or how it started? Or? According to the information we received, it originated from Congo. I think it's from Central Africa, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, according to the history, when we, when we do a, a little bit of research on the way it came from, I mean, they said there was a river, some story that, you know, linked to Congo, and after a while, and then it went away. <clears throat> you know, so, uh, I mean, we still looking and trying to find an actual fact, you know, but there's a lot of different stories. Yeah, right. I think it's for the scientists to tell us where it is, to research out the source of Ebola. But what we hear is that, uh, as far as I remember personally, in 1993, uh, I first heard of the president in Zaire, now Dr. Congo, for the first time I heard of Ebola. Uh, I never heard of it until after that, then until recently, in February of this year, when we heard I was in uh, Guinea, and we heard things like the bat, food bat, Sauce and people eat it. And as a result, the, you know, bush meat is one of the typical delicacies in Africa. It's very nice, very sweet, mm -hmm. like it. And people have to be shown it because of the Ebola. And so there's a saying that goes in Liberia, 
in one of the paper was uh, subtitles. You, uh, where we had um, the, 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 the goats, you know, they lived in the town. So they formed a line and went to see the president of Liberia, Dr. Sasata. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, Mr. Pres uh, Madam President, uh, she's a lady, uh, we hear that uh, most of the animals in the Buddha deer and all these animals, they are at risk of Ebola, so people are not killing them. Yeah. But we are at risk, Mr. President. Can you just give us a certificate to say we have Ebola? <laughs> so that the police can leave us alone. Mm. <laughs> so that's the situation. <laughs> A question back here. Uh, actually, actually, it's a comment. There, there has been an epidemiological study, and they have traced back down to one child as the source of this whole outbreak in Guinea. So that has been kind of found. So. Anyone else? <coughs> yes. Yeah, I understand very recent reports that there are fewer new cases in Liberia. It's actually on the down south in, in Liberia, and yet in, uh, in Sierra Leone and Guinea, there's quite a few new cases. It's still a fairly explosive outbreak. I wonder if you can speculate on why that would be, why that would be different. Um, uh, pretty much again, uh, you see, um, we, we go back where we came from, awareness. You know, because it first started in Monrovia, and they're trying to do everything to address the situation, to get people educated, and to take precaution. But then now it's moving to the interior, and then the same thing they have to do is awareness. We got lack of awareness, and people take the disease and spread it around. Because I think one of the reasons is awareness again is kind of move right. from one year spread from one place to another place. For example, in Liberia, uh, Monrovia, there was a town where one of the worst public districts in town. They called it West Point. Although West Point here did something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a different place. Now that's where. You know, so they decided to take the Ebola camp there because most of the cases were there. But the, the, uh, the community looked at it differently. They opposed it. The young guys came up. They, they, uh, they ransacked the Ebola camp. Patients ran away and all these kind of things were happening. All these things helped to, uh, you know, cause <coughs> accelerate the spread. And like my colleague just said, you know, with the education and understanding, uh, people should be able to do the right thing. Another question, I've um, I just wanted to add a comment to the um, question about whether, why it is spreading more in Sierra Leone now when it is no longer dissipating in Liberia. Um, Liberia has a strong relationship with America and has a lot of attention um, with America and with the West and as such. A lot of the information has been shared with the community and international communities. And so help has been coming to Liberia in droves. And, um, I'd say that the president necessarily has had a lot of relationships too with um, individuals and organizations within the United States that has come, given that need for people to get up and do something for Liberia. Sierra Leone, on the other hand, hasn't had as much of that attention and that help. And as such, information is, was not getting to them as quickly as it was in Liberia. So you have even more spread of the disease because there's no communication, there's very little information, and there's little that is shared. So as people are helping Liberia, Sierra Leone was just being left on its own, and now is the opportunity for people to help Sierra Leone, at which point much of it has spread already. And before you go, while you're up, uh, there's a, speaking of spreading awareness and doing good things, there's the Fight Ebola Saving Lives campaign locally. Perhaps you'd like to talk us, or tell us a little bit about that. So I'll take this opportunity to share. Um, Please. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Lillian McFarlane. I am the member of the, the Milwaukee African Women's Association and a member of the community. I personally am not from Liberia, nor Sierra Leone, nor Guinea, but I'm from nearby. I'm from Cameroon and Benin, West Africa. Wow. Mm -hmm. So when I think about my brothers and sisters, for me, it's close. If, whatever, if it spread more than what it is now that it's all contained, I knew that if it would cross from Sierra Leone and move on to Ghana and Togo and eventually get to Benin, there'd be no hope for my brothers and sisters in Benin because our infrastructure is nothing like Liberia. We're really behind Francophones, French-speaking. How many people are going to come up and join and help French-speaking Africans when you have the language barrier? So as a member of the Milwaukee African Women's Association, we decided that we wanted to do something from this distance, try and help in some way. We knew that the little that we could do would not do a lot, but it would do something. We couldn't just sit here and say, watching our brothers and sisters suffer, we can't do anything. Yes, we can. 
So we got together with the International Institute of Wisconsin, the Pan-African Community Association, the Sierra Leonean community, of which one of our members is here, um, and others, <laughs> the Liberian community as well. And as a group, we formed a coalition and created this Fighting Ebola Saving Lives, which we started at the end of October, the beginning of October, end of October, through November. And I don't know if you heard us on TV, maybe we had interviews with NPR and on TV, and we took the opportunity to get the community to come together in Milwaukee and donate items that we could sell and send initially to Sierra Leone. So today I have to say thank you to all of you who have been, who are aware of what we've done, who have helped us and have been able to donate the items which were um, gloves and um, hand sanitizers and things like that that were donated, the pick and saves that we had um, boxes at. I don't know if you heard, heard about them. We want to thank you because we were able to receive approximately 10,000 pieces of these different things from mm -hmm. all of you. Mm -hmm. Additionally, we had a goal of raising $3,000, and we raised 2800 to that first phase going to Sierra Leone, so we pretty much got to our 3000 goal. And after that, at the International Institute, we also raised another $2,000. So we got to a $5,000 campaign that we didn't think we would be able to do, and have been able to send this money to Sierra Leone and also to Liberia. So we know that we can, we've can. we done very little, but thanks to all of you, we've done a lot just from this distance. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you and just to share that we're not done. If we can keep talking, we can keep coming and having events, hearing what's going on, and share. Share and then give back. Given every small little dollar or item or whatever has been asked, it'll make a difference. As you can see, Liberia has received help, so we're only slowly getting it, and Guinea is also getting it. And we just pray that it doesn't cross. Mali had a case, mm -hmm. it's in control right now. Nigeria luckily had their cases, but definitely had the control because they have an infrastructure that is unbelievable in West Africa. If you go there, you see the chaos, but when you think about the chaos, you see what people are doing. They're able to contaminate, they're able to control and do more, more than what other parts of Africa can do. So I just want to say thank you. And on behalf of the coalition, Fighting Ebola Saving Lives, we just want you to continue doing this and we thank you for having this panel. And for you guys performing. So. Are you taking this? second phase, we're sending the money to um, Liberia. And we're going to go through a Doctors Without Borders just as this event is, is going through. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Well, we talked a lot about what's going on in the impacted countries. I'd like to spend just a, a few minutes before uh, we take a break and start our <clears throat> performance about what's going on in this country. We've heard a little bit about the positive things. We've also heard some less positive things. I uh, read recently of a university in Texas which summarily decided to deny applications of any student applying from the continent of Africa. We've seen other cases where uh, just people are, are facing stigma and, and prejudice just on the basis of, of where their family is from. So I'd like to ask our panelists you know, you've, you've, you've lived here now, you've been here for quite some time. What has been your experience since the crisis has really been in the headlines with regard to that sort of thing? Jeez. Well, <laughs> we've been getting a lot of uh, discrimination, I mean, discrimination. Like, people now see we Africans, like, people who like they should not even have contact with, you know. And this is some of the, I mean, uh, things that are affecting <coughs> us right now. Because, um, like, I was not in Freetown when the Ebola I mean, broke out. Mm -hmm. I was already in the United States, you know. But I have my family there, you know. Some of the things that we are suffering now is the stigma, you know, that experience. And, and, and we are, I mean, getting now, you know, because people who used to, I mean, come around us freely, they, sign, they, 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 they have some reservations, mm -hmm. you know, so we have to make ourselves clear, because in, in the first place, the disease was not caused, I mean, by our country, it is something that, I mean, was brought there, I don't know by what means, you know, but we are thankful to God, because, I mean, I had I mean, today that, I mean, 
in, in the space of how many, how many weeks? Uh, four months, I mean, four weeks. Yeah. We're going to declare I a mean, free town as Ebola free. You know? mm -hmm. So that's one of the good news I have today. Yeah, but I mean, it has caused a lot of problems on us as Africans as a whole. You know? Then I begin to, I mean, think again. Why Africa? You know, mm -hmm. what's the reason mm -hmm. that we should be suffering? We should be going through a real time. And we're just coming from, like my friend said already, we're just coming from war. Ten years of bloody war. Mm -hmm. In Liberia, in Sierra Leone, other parts of the world. You know? And again, we are experiencing this kind of deadly disease. My fear now is that, because we heard about HIV, which was like very much threatening too. And now this time around, we talk about Ebola. The degree to which Ebola has, uh, has gone is more, I mean, greater than the, the HIV is. So my fear now is, are we going to get, I mean, something else besides the Ebola that's more dreadful than the Ebola? Because at, at first we, have, we heard about, I mean, malaria that was killed. They, they, they found medicine for it. We heard about uh, typhoid, you know. We heard about, now we heard about, I mean, AIDS. Now it's Ebola. And it's like, Dominating, at any time we have a new one, it's like dominating the first one. So we, my own advice is that we pray for Africa, you know, because we are not experiencing peace at all, you know, I don't know why. So we have to actually pray for Africa, because when God wants to, to, to bring judgment on every, on every nation, he has to bring, I mean, he brings disease, sickness, you know. When we look back in medieval days, and in um, days of Pharaoh, you know, when Pharaoh was like very much disobedient, what God brought upon him was disease, sicknesses. So I, I think we have to pray for Africa, you know, for God to actually see reasons to set us free from these horrible things. How about you? Um, personally, um, my first experience was when I was at the Fort Fair, uh, recently hosted by the Institute of uh, International Institute of Wisconsin, where we went to volunteer, and we were in the Ebola boat, and we were telling people what it is, we want to keep it out, and the gentleman said, oh yeah, let's go back where it's coming from, Liberia, let's go back. I said, oh, we wanted to get it everywhere because even if we go back to Liberia, it's like they would spread throughout the world. So what they term as the epicenter of where the problem is, we want to put hands together and make sure we deal with that. And it's understandable why there is fear, especially people just coming from Liberia and traveling here and there, there's that stigma. And there are a lot of things that are really happening that, you know, we experience that they don't say or we don't hear in the press. And the way Liberians feel, especially uh, with regards to the most recent incident in Texas, Balance. So uh, it's human natural tendency to respond to things like that. You know, people naturally get fear. Like, oh yeah, if I come close to this person, this is going to happen to me. You know, it's a natural thing. And so we, on the other hand, kind of experience what, how people react to that situation. Uh, we hope that with the education of what Ebola is and with what is going on around. I told some of my colleagues who just spoke right here with the Ebola, the team that I also work with, that uh, there are some of our colleagues that say, oh, we shouldn't wear the Ebola shirt. We shouldn't talk about it because we talk about it. People will look down on you, they will think you are. <coughs> the biggest thing is that I am a Liberian, not Ebola. We are all humans, and we have to join hands to fight it. We must mm -hmm. educate each other to join hands and keep Ebola <laughs> out of the world. Thank you. Uh, just to add on to what Mr. Abu just said, uh, we had an experience two months ago. Uh, one of my friends, mother, who lived here in Milwaukee for eight years, she went to see a doctor at the hospital. So the nurse came and asked her, so, where are you from? Because you can tell from her dressing, hey, you know, where are you from? And what she said, She's from Liberia, big problem. Stop, 
she had to call other people <laughs> along Cuba in the country. Does she have Ebola? Okay. So again, going back to what Mr. Bo said, it's education. Come and ask questions, try to do some research, know about the, 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 the disease, the viral. Like what he said, we are not viral. We are just like you, you know. So by getting educated, that will help to educate those who don't want to be educated. And what's our opinion, Ikeo? We want to use it for the actual cause. You know, because a lot of people want to donate, but the question they ask, where it reach to the people that deserve the money? We can't control that. We will do what we can do, but it's up to the people who manage in the fund to make sure that those who need it get the fund. So do what you can do, and God will bless you. Thank you. Well, we, uh, we have another order of business of a, a happier sort to begin, but uh, before we do that, I'll give you an opportunity to just say any, any last things you think our audience should hear. Well, I would say the audience should not go. They should wait to hear the great music from us. <laughs> The great privilege of hearing the All Stars on several occasions throughout the course of the day. I suspect that uh, these chairs will have to go. Yeah. Yeah. So please feel free to move them out of your way as need be. We'll take a short break, get something to drink if you'd like, and uh, let's the rest of the evening again. But first, please thank our panelists.